Hi, I'm Jenny Hennepin, and I'm going to be talking to you today about Sarah Ellis Eddy. I came across her story uh, when I looked in a vertical file and found only one page, and this is what it said. Sarah Ellis Eddy started her career as a teacher, worked briefly in the dry goods business, then in the 1880s opened a woman's furnishing shop and bookstore called S.E. Eddy & Company. It went on to say that in the 1880s, women in Fort Collins were not typically seen in the business world or wearing men's clothing, but that didn't stop Sarah Ellis Eddy from doing both. Residents of Fort Collins noted Eddy walking around town in odd clothing, a man's suit jacket, skirt, man's hat, and a purse at her side. So let's think a little bit about what it would have meant to dress like a woman. I've got some shots here on the far left and the far right that show what dress in the 1870s and 80s would have looked like. And if you can imagine being a businesswoman walking through the unpaved streets of Fort Collins, it kind of makes sense that you would have dressed quote unquote like a man. So really it's not such an odd getup, but that it was odd to see a businesswoman in Fort Collins in the 1870s. I'm gonna quote here from our Barbara Fleming, our local historian. She said that for women to succeed in business in the late 19th and early 20th centuries required determination, courage, and the ability to overcome or work around obstacles, one of which surely was their resistance to the traditional role of women as homemakers, mothers, and wives. History records little about their struggles and triumphs as they, as they sought footholds in male-dominated professions in the business world. So it's hard to get the full picture, but let's try by looking at newspaper articles and pictures that mention Sarah Ellis Eddy. She was born in the East, December 12th, 1831, in the state of New York, and she attended Genesee College in Lima, New York. So we've got some pictures here, a map of Genesee Wesleyan in Lima on the left, in the center, a picture of the town hall in Lima, New York, and on the right, a map of Lima uh, about the time that she was there. She enrolled in what was called the scientific course at Genesee um, and here are a couple of the requirements, algebra, chemistry, geometry, French and German, botany, zoology, trig, philosophy, the list goes on. Suffice it to say there weren't too many women in 1857 that were attending college and that undertook a rigorous course like this one. And you can see that she's circled there on the right in the catalog from 1856-57, the women were listed after the men. Sarah went on to teach in Pennsylvania at Lebanon Valley Academy. Here's a picture on the left of how the academy looked um, in the 1867-68 catalog. In the middle, we have um, the document that I got some of this information on on the bottom and a cover of the founding of the college, uh, which is a picture again from the 1867 timeframe. And on the right is a newspaper article that I got from an archivist um, at Wesleyan. It says that in 1865-ish, she was a principal. It seems like that wasn't correct. She was a teacher, but she was definitely there in the 1860s teaching at Lebanon Valley. Sarah comes to Greeley. We'll talk a little bit later about what that meant to move west um, in the 1870s, but here are a couple of pictures of Greeley at the time. On the left, we have Greeley Public School, 1875. On the right, children at Meeker School in 1873. And in the middle, the Southward School at about 1870. And on the bottom in the middle, that's not a very good picture, but it shows 8th Street in Greeley in the 1870s. So in 1874, she came to Greeley and taught school for a year, and soon after that, she moved to Fort Collins.
So at the top, we have an article from The Courier in 1881 showing that she's opening her business. And on the right, we have a photograph that shows the northwest and southwest corners of Linden and Jefferson. And on the bottom left, a picture, again, look at the state of those streets that you would have been dragging your long dresses through if you dress like a woman. Um, that's looking at Linden Street from Jefferson Street. And then on the right bottom, we have a couple of ads for her store um, from 1882. So she opened her store in 1881. Uh, it would have been approximately where 216 Linden Street is now. So by all accounts, she went on to run a very successful business in Fort Collins. We've got a clipping at the upper left, um, an ad for cheap books. And at the center at the top, we have a view of Hoddle's Mill. Now we're looking southwest, Stover House is in the foreground. The spire in this distance is Old First Presbyterian Church. And to the right is Jefferson Street with the Yount Bank and City Hotel. On the bottom in the middle, is a photograph that shows 2110 Linden Street in 1887. So it's the same block, a little bit further from where her store was about five years before she was there. And on the right, we have a, another courier ad from 1885 showing all the things that you can get at her store. So here we have a death notice uh, published in the Courier on May 8th, 1884. It's for Vernette. Now that was Sarah's niece. Um, and in 1884, Sarah brought her niece who had uh, contracted malaria and consumption to Fort Collins, hoping that the climate would help her. And Sarah attended her constantly, but sadly Vernette died anyway at the very tender age of 19. So we can't know for sure that this death affected her strongly, but it seems like it would, and her life certainly took a different course shortly after Vernette's death. So what we see in the 1884-87 period is that Sarah began ranching. She began ranching in Wyoming with her friend Tracy Glime. So on the left, we have a clipping um, that lists the members of the Forestry Association. And look at some of those names that we have there. R.Q. Tenney, Abner Loomis, F.C. Avery, Ansel Watrous. So she was in very good company when she uh, joined the Forestry Association. In the center, we have a, a cover of a forestry publication for about that time. And also center bottom is a listing of her endeavors with other men in the community to uh, open a new ditch. And on the right hand side, there is a mention of a stockholders association meeting that was held uh, in her building and she was the board of Trust trustees secretary. On the bottom right is a mention of what her store was doing at the time um, and that she actually was selling it at this point to Elston Drug Company. So we have a period for her of traveling back and forth from her Wyoming property uh, to working still in Fort Collins as a very prominent citizen. On the left, we see a courier notice from 1899 that shows that she was a delegate to the Democratic uh, Congress, the Democratic primary. In the middle is an image, um, I'm sorry, it doesn't have anything to do with Sarah Elisetti, but I love this image. It's showing La Follette, Rose, and Livingston, who were suffragettes at the time. Um, and on the right, we have a listing of ladies being a helpful auxiliary to the chamber. So what was happening at this time is that women were giving lectures and Sarah Ellis Eddy gave a lot of lectures, many of which were noted in the newspaper, either by topic or even sometimes a full description of them. Some of the topics were the farmer in his fields. She did that in 1903. Some of the needs of our city. She gave that presentation in 1907 and Sociological Conditions in Larimer County, a presentation that she gave in 1909. 
So I call this Sarah's final act. We have here um, uh, a very beautiful tribute to her from her obituary in the, in the middle bottom. The destroying angel as of old sped forth on dark wings on Monday evening, February 14th, 1921, and bore the immortal spirit of Sarah Ellis Eddy to that undiscovered land beyond this misty veil shrouding the hearts of many and Fort Collins in weeds of woe. So before she died, we have a very interesting mention in a newspaper on the left. So apparently uh, a child was left on a back porch of a farmhouse. And while the men of the town were trying to figure out what to do with this three week old infant, Sarah Ellis Eddy steps forward and offers to foster this child. So she would have been 78 years old at the time. And I just love this image of a woman stepping up and doing what needed to be done to take care of this helpless infant. In the middle at the top, um, we have sort of a sad mention of some fights by relatives over her estate. I won't go into too many details, but there are several articles that you can read about that. And on the right, we have a, a Courier article from 1914 talking about some ditch activity that she was involved in at the time. So what questions are you left with? I know I have quite a few after reading these um, articles and seeing these pictures of Sarah Ellis Eddy. The main one is, why did Sarah Ellis Eddy travel west? Now, at that time, in the 1860s, 1870s, teaching was the most accessible and accepted professional career for women in the west. Um, in the 1840s and up to the early 1860s, the National Popular Education Board invited 600 teachers from the eastern United States to fill teaching positions in the West. Now, we don't know if Sarah availed herself of that service, but it's certainly possible. So many of these women jumped at the opportunity to start a new life in a part of the country that was much more egalitarian and non-Orthodox than in the East. So another question I'm left with after reading about all these presentations that she gave and that other women gave around town, what can women's lectures tell us about women's participation in politics at the time? So again, in the late 1860s, 1870s, there was a movement across America to form women's clubs. And over time, they evolved into forums for political and educational and community activism. These clubs formed a network of support for women, and they were integral in helping these women gain a voice and influence in communities dominated by men. So I mentioned some of the other articles, um, some of the other presentations that Sarah gave. One of them that really struck me was uh, a piece that she wrote and that was presented in person about not dressing up too much when you go to church because it embarrassed people who couldn't afford nice clothes. And I think that was very interesting that obviously dress, how people dress, the effect of dress on the community was something that was very important to her. So my last big question, of course, is what does it mean to dress like a man? Um, just a quick rundown of the pictures here on the screen. In the upper left, we have a, um, a John Singer Sargent painting uh, from 1897. To the right of that is um, Greta Garbo in a top hat. To the far right is a picture of Coco Chanel. Now that's from the 1920s, a little bit later, but that is about the time that uh, Sarah Ellis died. And in the bottom left, we've got just women in kind of maleish garb, again, likely from the 1920s or 1910s. So what does it mean to dress like a man? We have some oral histories that you can come and listen to in the archive. And uh, one woman who was um, a servant at the Avery House talked about her, talked about Sarah Ellis Eddy, and said there was one woman who used to come there a lot. I don't know what to call it, but she was half and half. She was half man and half woman. She wore a hat. She had short hair. She had a man's haircut and a man's hat and a man's coat and a shirt and a necktie and then a short skirt that came to her knees. And she used to come to Frank Avery's. 
The first time I opened the door, I stood and looked at her. I said, Mrs. Avery, there's a funny looking thing at the door. Shall I let her in or let him in or what? And Mrs. Avery stopped to laugh. She said, Mary, that's Mrs. Eddy. Just let her in. And she was the nicest thing I ever met. So there's definitely acceptance after people got over the oddity of her dress um, attire. Sarah's mentioned in a few other oral histories that we have in the archives. Um, on the left, we have Milton Coy Hoffman and Lydia Hoffman Morrison, obviously much younger at the time of the picture than they were when they gave the oral history. And at the right, uh, Louise Greenacre Hosack, pictured in 1900. Uh, she's another person who speaks on this oral history that we have in the archive from 1974. It also describes her garb, talks about her being half and half, but somehow that became a belief that she might have been a hermaphrodite. Um, but again, that description of her attire ends with a discussion of her being totally accepted. Yes, she was accepted and was a big part of the community. So I find that very um, uplifting. So before I end, I just wanna uh, give a little information about uh, where I found the second portrait of Sarah Ellis Eddy. It was inside a box that we had of portraits that had been noted but not yet scanned. On the right, you see the cover of this beautiful photo album. On the left, an inside picture of what the portrait looks like that are in the, the, the portraits that are in the book. And in the middle, one of the two portraits that we found of Sarah Ellis Eddy in this beautiful book. Um, we've been posting pictures from this box 111 on our Facebook page. So please check those out and uh, enjoy the beautiful photography of that time. It was a conversation with a colleague that led to the discovery of this second photograph of Sarah Ellis Eddy and to this beautiful photo album and to this story that I've been able to tell you about her. It was also through the help of archivists from Syracuse, Syracuse University and Genesee College that let me fill in the blanks on the early part of her story. Thank you so much for listening to this fascinating story of Sarah Ellis Eddy. Uh, you can definitely learn more about her in the archive and I appreciate your time today.